think density of fishermen is easily enough to reduce the fish populations very, very quickly. The fish cannot sustain those losses. They, they can't breed fast enough to, to replace uh, what we take taking away. I'm afraid the fish can't keep up. Hi guys, so today I'm really fortunate to have a small chat to Associate Professor Colin Atwood from UCT and then Lisa Swartz from, she has such a long name, I'm going to have her to pronounce it to you guys what her role is. Hi, good morning. I'm a technician at the Department of um, Forestry, Fisheries and Environment and um, I run the tagging project here at Duwap Nature Reserve. Okay, see guys, it's a long, it's a long name. But Lisa, thank you for having me. It was an absolutely incredible weekend. It's my second time in, in the whip and every time I'm just amazed at the place, at the biomass of fish that is in this place, as well as just the scenery and the landscape is really, really amazing. Please tell me, how long have you been running this MPA and what you actually, what is your role at the MPA? And how so, so um, I don't work with this MPA, but um, the department pays um, Cape Nature to manage the MPA and we have a collaborative project um, to run the tagging. The department took it over from the university in 1995, but it's at ra it started 10 years before that already. So um, we've been running it since September 1995. Yeah, that's amazing. And we've been coming on the trip six times a year since then, yeah. Lisa, one of the things that you made um, pointed out a lot on this trip is proper fish handling, fish care, how to proper tag a fish properly. Um, does that have an impact on the survival rate of fish? Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on that? Yeah, price, please? it definitely has an effect. You know, um, the fish have a protective slime layer. You don't want them to lose scales, especially the big fish like cob and stenrus. If they lose a lot of scales, they can get infection there. And even though you think you're releasing a beautiful fish, it, it makes it vulnerable to predators in the first place. And in the second place, um, it can get infections and systemic infection and just over time not do well and maybe die. We don't know. But we do know that often we've, if a fish is very badly tagged or badly handled, we don't get a recapture. So we, we just assume it's done, uh, it's died. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the, my big thing is when a person catches a fish, Please use some smooth type of canvas or something. We have these stretchers that we catch the fish in. Try not to touch your fish as little as possible. Have a wet cloth to put over the eye. You'll find if you put a wet cloth over the eye, the fish doesn't um, uh, wiggle down. around yeah. so much. And then it's easier to tag or just take a, and then quick, take a quick photograph. And if you want to release your fish, release it through the stretcher again. Um, you know, just a quick thing on, on, on that, your average guy that's fishing on the beach don't always carry a stretcher with them or yeah. not, not even a cloth. It might be handy to have a cloth in your bag, but if you don't have a stretcher, it might be important for the guys to know to not fish, pick the fish up by the gills and support it by yeah. the belly and then yeah. work on the wet sand opposed to on carrying the dry it all sand. the way yes, to the dry sand. Yes, that makes a big difference. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and often people want to tag and then if you have a little bucket of water maybe with you and just rinse the sand off, especially if you're going to tag it. If you're no, not, not going to it. not wipe it yes. because you're wiping that slime layer off. So you just want to be gentle with your fish. Don't put your hands on the gills. And if you're removing hooks and stuff, try not to take too much and struggle with it. Take pliers and just quickly remove it. You don't want to, you want your fish to be out of the water as little and as short a period of time as possible. Okay. On, on the hook topic at the moment, on that strip we were only allowed to use circle hooks. Yeah. Is there anything that you could see a decline or increase in the survival rate 
from using Circulux, from JX to Circulux, how, what was the impact from using Circulux opposed to JX? So initially we were using JX as well, and then for two years we had half our anglers use JX and half the anglers use Circulux, and we had less swallows. Um, the circle hooks are almost always caught in the corner of the mouth, which is great and far easier to remove than a J-hook. And with less swallows, you get less fish mortality. Yeah, oh, amazing. I, I prefer circle hooks as well. And it, you actually miss less, less fish, so yeah. it's a great hook to use. Okay, Lisa, fish handling is really important, but now the time exposed to, to air, that must be really important as well. Yes, especially if guys want to tag their fish. You have got to ca uh, catch it, Measure it, tag it, release it with in less than two minutes if you can. I sometimes secretly time my anglers and the average is about one minute, 40 seconds. So um, the idea is the fish must get back in the water as quickly as possible. You know, if you have certain fish that are very, very uh, which die easily, like your bellman and things like that. And you have fish that are a little bit tougher, like your chaldean. But the general rule is get them back in the water as quickly as possible. Yeah, and that also helps if the guys are fishing on the rocks and have a rock pool close by, put the fish on the rock yes. pool while they're gathering yeah. the, the applicator and, and the, the tagging, tagging kit and all, the, all yeah. of those things that they need. We, we have one or two taggers here that are very good. What they do is once they've finished um, tagging a fish, they already get the tag number, the applicator ready for the next fish. So once they actually catch the fish, it's a measure, tag, release. In less than two minutes. Yeah. An applicator should be cleaned. Rinse it in a on water. You know, if you're putting sand into the fish, you, you're going to cause an infection. So you want a clean applicator. You want a clean tag. Um, you want a clean surface that you put it on. Um, so if you have a little bucket of water, rinse where you're going to tag, and then tag as quickly as possible. Absolutely. The tagging process <coughs> is also important because um, there's a big movement towards tagging. Uh, tag and release, but I've been seeing on social media a lot of fish that are tagged incorrectly um, Especially um, edibles. There's a lot of people that tag sharks for instance, and they tag next to the dorsal fin um, And then when I switch to uh, uh, edible fish like a whole yun or a steam bus, they actually tag too far forward It looks like it's almost on top of the head and in sharks also you tag just into the flesh Where on edible fish if this is the spine of the fish and the, the, the spikes um, going through to the back, you want the tag to go in, you're going to turn it and pull out so it hooks yes. through. Um, and uh, we often see very, um, just under the skin tags, or it's sticking out at such a big angle, you want it to be streamlined with the fish so it doesn't cause a lot oh, of water resi yeah. resistance. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's good information. And then just something for you, um, I, a lot of guys, when you speak to them, anglers, They'll often say that, well, us re recreational anglers or shore anglers won't have any impact on the fish population. But obviously, I've been fishing here for four days and I've seen the fish that the edible guys have, been, have caught. Well, the fish that we've caught has been really amazing. It's been one of the spots, of, it's, it's certainly a spot that you don't see big punskop anymore. And here on this trip, two decent punskop came out in not perfect weather. So obviously we as recreational anglers would have an impact on the fish population. Obviously you have something to add to that as how recreational anglers have an impact on fish populations from shore. Oh yeah, look there's a lot more fish inside the marine protected area than than outside and that holds not only for the work but also all the other marine protected areas where, where anglers have been excluded. So of course we can conclude from that that, that to just the removal of, of anglers has resulted in the increase of, of fish um, inside protected areas uh, compared to outside. A lot of anglers really struggle to believe that. They, they, they struggle to accept that that they can have an impact um, on fish populations and you know always point to to commercial operations as the ones that are, are decimating the oceans but the truth of the matter is that the fish that we catch in the surf zone and, and off the rocks are are not the ones caught by commercial fishermen um, it's the anglers themselves uh, that have reduced the populations and the statistics we keep here have helped us um, work out uh, 
exactly what the impact of fishermen has been on, on many of our coastal fish stocks. So we, we've done research on, on Holyun, obviously, that's the, the main catch we get here. Um, but we've also been looking at, at cob, white steer and brush. Um, and yeah, I, can, I can give you a couple of numbers that you can perhaps think about. Um, of all the Holyun that we've tagged, we catch about 8% of them again. Yeah. Only so in the MPA. In the MPA. So some of them stray outside, which is also a good thing because the, the fish from the marine protected area are moving outside and, and repopulating other areas. Uh, so that's also a bonus. But the bulk of them are staying here. Um, so we find that about 8% of the fish that, that we catch and tag get recaught. Now, we bring 10 anglers here for four days at a time. And at each of the two areas we fish, uh, Lack of Arta, where we are now, and then Kopio Leon, we go there three times a year. So if you do the multiplication, we've got uh, 10 anglers times four days, so that's 40 angler days, and times three for each of the sites, so that's um, 120 angler days, which, and we've spread that out over three and a half kilometers of beach. So that amount of fishing uh, results in us catching 8% of our fish back. If, if we had killed the fish and not tagged them, as would have happened outside a marine protected area, it should be obvious that we wouldn't have recaught them because mm. we killed them the first time, which means that our catches would be 8% lower than they are. So you can do the <coughs> arithmetic. Um, 120 angler days over the course of a year, over three and a half kilometers, is enough to reduce the Holyun population by 8%. So y you work out how many, you from Stolbeck, um, you try and work out how many anglers there are per kilometer per day. And I can assure you it's about 10 to 15 times greater than what's happening here. If those, if those fishermen kill their fish, um, the impact would be ten times higher than the scenario I've just given you. So, you know, it's uh, scary. It, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, it's it's not a it, it, it's not a linear process. So I'm not going to tell you that ten times more would be yeah, an eighty yeah, percent yeah. reduction. Yeah, but it's not difficult to understand that the amount of fishing pressure we're seeing at places like Strace by Arniston in particular, Stolbay is pretty heavily fished. Um, that sort of density of fishermen is easily enough to reduce the fish populations by 80-90% very, very quickly. And I'm afraid this, the long-term statistics bear out what I'm saying. The, the um, rate of, of the rate at which we're catching fish is very, very high. The fish cannot sustain those losses. They, they can't breed fast enough to, to replace uh, what we're taking away. The number of anglers is high and is increasing um, pretty much all around everybody you know everybody wants a bit of recreation everyone's entitled to go fishing they buy their permit they go fishing the number of people on the coast is going up people are steadily getting wealthier and wealthier so they can afford better tackle the fishing equipment that we're using is far more effective than it used to be so even on e even in the last couple of days you would have heard people talk about tackle improvements all the time all anglers do they, they always trying to use better and better mm. and better equipment. What that effectively means is that uh, more and more fish are being killed as a result of this. Um, we're very, very effective now at fishing. And uh, I'm afraid the fish can't keep up. Um, that's why the protected areas are, are absolutely necessary to try to protect some breeding stock and also in some cases, like, like the white steam brass here, it's essential that we protect the young stages so that they can get to 67 centimeters. That's, that's the size at which they become sexually mature. They can't breed before then. We've got to protect those fish. When they get big, then they'll leave the protected area and they'll move off to the spawning grass. If we don't protect those young stages and allow them to, to reach the age of maturity, 
Uh, there's absolutely no ways that, that the white steel bus stock, for example, would, would be able to sustain the amount of fishing pressure. Um, I could make similar arguments about things like Kholyun and Cobb, although they've all got different life histories and movement patterns, but all of them have benefited enormously from, from having a couple of protected areas around the coast. There's, there's one at Still Bay, um, Sitsikama, obviously. Um, there's one or two areas in False Bay, and right around the coast, right up to, to Sedwana, for example, there are, are protected areas uh, where we conserve the breeding potential of, of the fish stock. Yeah, so at the end of the day, it boils down to you as an individual to not only protect the fish, but do the ethical thing in the right way and just fishing or to fish sustainable. And it's a mindset change that we need to to do, to go, go about. And um, I do think there is a more positive upswing in the last three to five years. I don't know if you have noticed it, but still, I think the percentage of, of people that actually practice catch and release versus the guys that are killing fish unnecessarily mm -hmm. is, is still um, too, too far apart. <laughs> they, but that's where we need as anglers that actually protect fish and do this ethical thing and sustainable fishing. We need to educate more people and more and more people and hopefully those people will educate even more people and slowly we can maybe win this thing but at this stage it seems like for species like cob and your black muscle cracker from the surf in the, in the surf zone that is now from shore and white stem steamers those those species are the numbers are really declining like like you said so I don't know. Um, do you think it might change for the better in the future, or are we creating? Yeah, no. Look, I, I am optimistic about it. There has been a, a change in behaviour of anglers. Um, certainly, I, I see it wherever I go. People are more aware of it. Um, but there's still a lot of a lot of work that, that needs to be done. There's a very comprehensive set of regulations. Um, I find not many anglers are familiar with them. The, the bag limits, the size limits, the close seasons. Um, as a first step, I think anglers need to familiarise themselves with all of those rules and regulations. You know, I quite often go to a place and find that anglers kept a small mussel cracker, for example, or a small white steam bus, and you go and ask them about it, and they didn't know, or that they thought it was a very impressive fish. You know, someone catches a 55 centimetre mussel cracker, it's, it's, it's a nice fish to take home and eat. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's undersized. Um, mm. And many of them just didn't know that regulation. So, firstly, get to know the bag limits and the size limits. They, they're pretty good. They, they were designed on, on scientific evidence in, in almost all cases. And if, if the anglers at the very least uh, stick to the regulations, that's, that's, you know, if everyone stuck to the regulations, we'd be all right. I'm afraid, uh, I can't say that that is true. A lot of yeah. anglers um, do not. But I would also make an appeal to anglers to say, you know, don't, just take what you need. Uh, there's no need to take your limit. You know? No, the li you, limit is not a target. <laughs> it's not a target. Yeah. Um, you know, we all like to take a fish every now and then. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just, just make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's legally taken, um, and try to try to limit the amount of fish you take out of the ocean. Always bear in mind the fish are are struggling. Um, to maintain their, their, their populations in the, in the face of this incredible onslaught from recreational anglers with their very, very sophisticated equipment. Um, a species really close to my heart is, is the cob. And the cob's size limit, minimum size limit, to me is like almost a sensitive topic because they, if you can share some information when they actually sexually mature and what is the size limit and motivate anglers to throw those big cob back and release them. I remember the first time that I came here, Lisa told me about bobs and bobs were oh, yeah. big old <laughs> fat female, well, fertile yes, female. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's one thing I remember from my first trip. So it's the bigger the cob get, the more eggs they produce. So obviously yeah, exponentially more yeah, eggs, yeah. yeah. The, the cob is a very complicated story. Um, and you know, the first thing you've got to appreciate is that there are two species in this part of the world and the, the, the silver cob and the dusky cob and they mature at, at different sizes so the silver cob uh, you'll find in the days they're maturing at a, 
are about 40 centimeters, so they're quite small by the time they, they become mature. Uh, but the dusky cob, which is the one that we get from the, from the coast, from the, from the estuaries and from the surf zone and from the rocks, they mature at a much, much larger size, typically around about a meter. That's a big so, fish. Yeah. So, um, but there, there is quite a bit of variation within both species. So it's not to say every single fish will become a mature yeah. at that size, but that's that's a typical guideline. So, um, the, the reason those bag uh, size limits have, have been set the way they are um, is to is to allow the fish to reach an age at which they can breed. It stands to reason if you kill all the fish before they get to a breeding age, well, that, that's the end of it. Yeah. You know, there just won't be any more uh, fish recruitment after that. Um, so we've got to make sure that the fish can, can breed at least once in their life. Um, in fact, we know that they need to breed many, many, many times, year after year after year. So at the very least, we try and, and protect them until the age at which they become um, sexually mature. And uh, it, it, as I say, the cob's complicated because of, of the two species. And, um, the ones, the, the silver cob are typically caught from the boats, the dusky cob from, from the shore. Yes. Um, don't you think it, it might be a good idea to put a maximum size limit on a fish like a cob as well, to, to protect the, the large females and the large males that's going to produce millions and millions <laughs> of eggs? Yeah, it, it's a debate we've had many, many times over and there's, a, there's a, a lot of good arguments to have maximum Maximum size limits are applied in certain parts of the world to certain species, and something like cob might be a good candidate for it. On the other hand, there are arguments the other way. Um, the, the big fish exhaust themselves uh, when they fight. Um, you know, a cob of 1.3, 1.4 meters, you, you're typically fighting it for 30 sometimes 40 minutes. So the fish is absolutely exhausted, it gets dragged over the rocks, people don't know how to handle it properly. By the time they've looked at it, taken their photo, decided what to do and put it back, I, I can assure you the fish is pretty much dead. So the chance of, of these bigger fish actually surviving the ordeal, which by the way is very, very traumatic for the, for the fish. I mean, you've got to understand the fish is fighting for its life, it's, it's, you know, it's the equivalent of you going for a mm. 20 kilometer run flat out. Um, and then they starve you of oxygen for a couple of minutes after that. The chance of you surviving that is, is very slim. So that's what we, we think about is we, we can insist that, it, that anglers put the big fish back, but we're worried about the survival of those big fish. Um, so on balance, for most fish, um, we've kept with the bag limits and size limits such that these, these smaller fish are the ones that we protect and we allow them to get to, to, the, to the larger size. Also, it's very unpopular among among most anglers. They want to catch a big, they want to take a big fish home. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the reality of it. So there is quite a bit of a resistance. You can understand somebody catching a you know, big fish and then they have to, within a minute, <coughs> put the thing back in the water unharmed before they can get photographs and all of that. Um, yeah, these arguments go on and on. But in theory, the, the maximum size limits are a good idea um, and that is in fact one of the considerations that led to the size limits on cob why we've restricted the amount of, of very large fish that, that can be taken. So is there something to, to add to that is if, if an angler knows he's into a big cob and he's got mates with the fishing with him. It's better for them to go fetch the measuring tape, fetch the camera while they're sitting and land that fish in the safest possible place, keep it wet, keep it close to the water. And once you pick it up for the photo, work quick and, um, like I said, support the fish underneath the belly and then take a photo and put it back as soon as possible. Then you have the highest chance of, of surviving. Yeah. So it's all about the handling process, especially with a big, yes. a large fish like yes. that doesn't handle quick and easy as like a two kilo fish. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Look, their, their, their bodies are not designed to be in air. They mm. get crushed by their own weight. Um, trying to lift it is really not a great idea at all. If, if you're catching it on the beach, just leave it on the wet sand uh, in reach of the waves so you don't actually have to take it mm. out. Just try, if you have to, try to get the photograph in situ, take the hook out, uh, to, you know, turn it around as best and as easily as you can and get it back mm. to sea. Um, that's the best chance. Always think about the analogy I gave you, you've run a 20 kilometer marathon, yes. you didn't expect to do it, 
you were having breakfast, somebody <laughs> told you start running. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely exhausted. Um, and now someone just says, well, you can't breathe for a couple of minutes. While they bang you around and subject you to, to handling and forces that your body's mm -hmm. not designed to. Not, not many people are going to survive that. And it's the same with fish. And the problem is the fish goes back and you think, oh, well, it's swimming all right. It's heading off to sea and it's swimming. Um, the problem is that there's a whole bunch of sharks just sitting out there and they pick up the weakness in the fish. Yeah. You know, they they pretty sense pretty that there's a fish that's slow. He's not feeding well. It's an easy target. And the sharks will just prey on it in yeah. within so vulnerable 10 to predators, minutes. Yeah. That, um, that's really the problem. It's, it's not so much that they, they might survive if you put it in a tank and look after it very nicely. Uh, you know, but they've, they, they go out here, they've got bronze waders, ragged teeth sharks, white sharks, all kinds of things, just looking for an easy meal. So, um, think very carefully you know, about what you're doing. Just to quickly sum all of this up, it all boils down to the individual, handle the official care, treat the cost, and we might have a better future ahead. Yeah. So that is all, and um, Lisa, thank you for your time. Colin, really mm -hmm. thank you for, for speak, taking the time to speak with me. And um, Lisa and Colin, both great work that you guys do, and please carry on with the massive work that you've done here. I know it's not easy running this whole project and sometimes you have a couple of hooligans like me and my brother <laughs> that come and fish here. And um, you deal with little IT with us and it was an amazing week and incredible. And um, yeah, thank you for that. It's an absolute pleasure. And you know, anglers must enjoy their fishing and just stick to the bag and science limits. I mean, they may all carry on enjoying their fishing. Exactly. They can do that. That's all we want to do is catch the fish <laughs> and enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. Thanks. Ooh, good. Good. <laughs> 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 Thanks. 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 Thanks.